There are lots of books and in a way um, it draws on a lot of work that's been done over the last 30 years, very detailed work, particularly about looking at how the war in Ireland developed in the in different regions and, and different counties. Yeah, But what I want to try and do is partly synthesize that, but also sort of place these events in the context of a world in total turmoil after the First World War. And to an extent a lot of what's been written about Ireland is written from the point of view uh, that it's as if Ireland is separate from, not, it's kind of an imagine, in imagination in Ireland as much as in reality, separate from what's going on and I want to far more connected to the world. And the second thing I want to do is to give a sense of what it was like, not so much um, to 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 orchestrate these events because again we've got a lot of books which tell us a lot about what's happened in different ambushes and military books and high political books but it's partly trying to look at this from the point of view of people who are living through this experience and in a way I wanted to give a sense of the experience of these years um, as much as give an account of, of the people, the generals and the politicians who dominated these years. The Irish revolutionaries uh, are culturally very interested in de-anglicising Ireland, uh, creating this uh, Irish state with a, with a very distinctive Irish culture. But they're missing the bigger story almost, of, which is the Americanization of the whole world, which is now beginning after the, after the First World War. So American products, um, typewriters, chewing gum, etc. Pens. American pro products are now flooding Europe and Americans are looking outward, although America becomes quite isolationist at the end of this period after the First World War, but it doesn't become isolationist in commercial terms. It sees the rest of the world as a great vast market uh, to which it wants to sell its goods. And Ireland is right in the middle of this. I think what I try to do in the book is look at these events from a different perspective. As I've said, we know a lot about many of these events, but it's putting them in a, looking at, at them through to, at a slightly different angle and looking at it through a different prism, which makes them seem much more actually contemporary, much more, you know, one thing I wanted to see was Irish revolutionaries are often seen very much from the point of view of um, restoring some kind of ancient nation um, as, as their nationalism is something, um, certainly from the 19th century, and of course there is that basis there, but actually I wanted to see them as very much very modern people in a very modern moment, um, when a moment when self-determination, a moment when national sovereignty uh, has become the political fashion, the political lodestar around the world. In other words, it's no surprise that Ireland didn't escape this. And then of course, you, when I look at some of the people I look at in the book and whose diaries I've drawn on, I've drawn on them not because they're representative of particular political factions, but that they somehow represent Irish people struggling with the idea that they want to be, they are, might be nationalist, but they're also interested in American films, that they're aware of uh, the, that uh, they want, uh, the, in one case particularly, a woman who is both a Quaker, a feminist, uh, a nationalist, um, uh, coming to terms with uh, ca the Catholic Church in Ireland, but also liking to go and watch um, boxing matches beamed into cinemas. Um, and so that it, it's that, it's how Ireland was tussling with the very modern world in which it's trying to stake its claim in one way's one of the ways it's trying to stake its claim is to try and revive its distinctive culture at a moment when, in a way, the global culture is being changed by the United States.